Um, good morning, everyone. Nancy and I will be um, tag teaming on this presentation. I'm going to give an overview of the entire study. Um, Nancy is going to present the results from the um, screening survey, the first survey, and then I'll present some of the preliminary results from the follow-up survey, which I'll describe as we go along. So um, Chuck gave a good introduction of what we were trying to do through this study, and um, we, when we made statements about people in New York, we wanted to be able to do more than just make statements about um, a, um, people in New York statewide, because we felt like different parts of the state would have people with different attitudes, beliefs, understanding, and we wanted to be able to point to what some of those differences were. Um, the prison boundary seemed like the logical way to divide up the state into regions for our, uh, our study, um, but we didn't have sufficient funding to um, survey residents of each of the eight regions, and so some of them we ended up combining. So when you see some of the results we present, um, some of them will be presented by the regions, um, New York um, and Long Island is one region, New York City and Long Island. Um, the Lower Hudson and the Catskills are a second region. Um, Capital Mohawk was a region on its own. Um, the Adirondacks and St. Lawrence Eastern Lake Ontario was a combined region. Um, the Finger Lakes is a region. And then the Western New York is a region in our results. So you'll see that as we go along. Through the entire study, there were a number of characteristics that we wanted to be able to measure. Um, first of all, we wanted to have some understanding of whether people were aware of invasive species, both in general and particular species. We wanted to assess what kind of concerns they had about them, how much concern and what types, um, get a basic understanding of what their knowledge of invasive species was. And we wanted to be able to identify certain key stakeholder groups that can play a particular role in helping to prevent the spread of invasive species. Um, um, you know, anglers or boaters or people who go hiking, groups that might be of particular concern. We wanted to find out how many people were in those groups and get some indicators of their behaviors. In addition, if necessary, we wanted to know whether people would be willing to change their behaviors to respond to invasive species concerns, um, to do some preliminary testing of messages to find out how persuasive they might be, um, and encouraging behavior change, and then finally to find out what information sources they use to get a good sense of, of, of where, um, how, how best to reach them potentially. Our working assumption was that most residents of New York State would have low awareness of invasive species and little knowledge of invasive species. And what that told us is that we didn't want to just um, do a, uh, a sample of, a random sample of residents of New York and ask them a bunch of questions about invasive species because if people didn't know what invasive species were, they're not going to be able to tell us how concerned about invasive species they were, what they believed to be true about invasive species, and things of that nature. So for that reason, we set up the study um, with several different phases. Um, first, we conducted a telephone screening survey. This is the survey that Nancy will be talking about in a moment. Um, in which um, we did take a random sample of people across the state and we asked them um, questions to assess their basic awareness of invasive species, to find out if they knew what they were, if they recognized particular invasive species. For people who had a basic awareness of invasive species, um, um, we followed up then with this more intensive follow-up web mail survey, and that's what I have preliminary results to present from today. In addition, um, some of those people with a basic awareness of um, invasive species will also be participating in stakeholder interviews, which are just getting underway and which I'll describe a bit more in a little bit. So to find out whether people were aware of invasive species in our telephone screening survey, we asked the question, before I called today, had you ever heard the term invasive species? If someone said no to that, we followed up and said it means non-native plants and animals that can cause harm to the environment, the economy, and society. Have you ever heard of plants or animals like that? If a person said yes in answer to either of these questions, then they were included in a follow-up survey. So that's just something to keep in mind um, when you see some of those results of the follow-up survey in a, in a short while. <clears throat> 
the follow-up survey um, had two types of questions in it. One were questions that, as I indicated before, required uh, a basic awareness of invasive species. And there were also a series of stakeholder-specific questions. Um, and these were questions about behaviors um, that were relevant to that stakeholder group that might either spread or prevent the spread of invasive species. Um, the stakeholder interviews were very similar, um, are going to be very similar. They'll have similar types of topics that they cover. But in the interviews, we're really targeting groups that are too small to be able to make meaningful statements about based on the survey. So for example, farmers, there were few enough people that we got in our sample of New York State residents that even if we included survey questions targeting farmers, we wouldn't be able to make meaningful statements about farmers. So farmers were targeting um, with these interviews. Um, and this slide shows um, for the follow-up survey on the left, um, the stakeholder groups that we ask questions about are anglers, boaters, campers, hikers, and gardeners. And then in the interviews, the stakeholder groups we're targeting are water gardeners, aquari aquarium owners, and farmers or nursery stock, stock growers. Our timeline for this project, um, the screening survey, as I indicated, um, was carried out and completed in the fall. Um, we prepared a report that was published in January based on the results of that survey. Um, the follow-up web mail survey has been completed. We've begun data analysis on that, and that's what you'll see preliminary results from today. And we'll have a final report next month for that. And then finally, the stakeholder interviews are just getting underway, and we plan to report on those in June. So now I'm going to turn over um, to Nancy, and she'll talk about the telephone screen survey. Great. Thanks, Bruce. Um, I'm going to talk about these uh, results a little bit for a few minutes. Uh, those of you who've attended the CCE in-service in November, uh, where I presented the preliminary results of the, the screening survey, we'll find the results I'm going to talk about today very familiar. Uh, things didn't really change much from the preliminary results uh, to these, the final results. Also, I wanted to mention that the detailed results from this portion of the study are available now online, and we'll put a link to these results up in our last slide. So just a, a quick review of the methods Bruce talked a little bit about. Uh, we sampled by geographic regions using the prisms as that underlying structure, and we had to combine a couple in order to um, be able to financially afford the, the study. Um, we did conduct enough interviews in each region to make region-specific estimates, and then we combined the regions to make statewide estimates. And the surveys, or the interviews that we conducted happened between September and November. Um, those that we reached uh, by telephone, 79% uh, of them completed the interview with us. And so that was a total of 3,406 uh, people that we spoke with. Um, of those we reached on the phone, 8% refused to be interviewed, which is a nice low number. Um, and 3% couldn't be interviewed because of a language problem. English was not uh, their first language. That percentage was, as we would expect, higher in the New York City and Long Island region. So the results I'm going to uh, talk about today, uh, three parts to the screening interviews, uh, this general awareness of invasive species, uh, some characterizations of the stakeholders, and then the third is uh, where do New Yorkers go sort of for their news and information? What sources do they use? I'm not actually going to cover that third one uh, today. Um, you can find those results in the, the report. Basically, I'm not going to talk about them because they sort of follow along what you would expect. Uh, most people are getting their news from the TV and Internet, and there's not really very many differences statewide. So here's sort of the first uh, data slide talking about the overall awareness of invasive species. And as Bruce mentioned, the um, awareness, the overall awareness, um, which is in blue here on the slide, was a combination of both um, were people aware of the term invasive species or were they aware of the definition that we provided. So if you look on the far right, you can see statewide um, over 70% uh, of New Yorkers were either aware of that term or knew the definition. Um, and then as you sort of move back to the left, 
you can see the, the various regions, most of them are higher than the statewide average, but New York City and Long Island is lower. Uh, the yellow bars uh, represent a sort of a measure of knowledge. People told us that they know at least something about invasive species. And those percentages, of course, are much less. Um, statewide, it's just about a third of people. Um, in the other regions, it's generally more. But then in New York City and Long Island, it's less. Um, we also asked people about uh, their awareness of certain select uh, invasive species. And we asked this question, these questions about these particular species before we asked um, about uh, their knowledge of invasive species so as not to sort of bias them by saying, oh, these are invasive species, you know, um, you should know about them. We asked them first about the species. So we asked um, about water chestnut and wild pigs. Those are on the left there. Those are the ones that people uh, were most likely to say that they were, they'd recognized the name or they knew a little bit about the species. And then as you sort of go to the right, um, awareness becomes uh, less. So sort of zebra mussels, wild parsnip are sort of intermediate. Um, emerald ash borer, hydrilla, and kudzu are on the, the far right there. And very few people um, recognize the name that's in green or know something about those species, which is in yellow. Um, we also broke down the results by the different regions that we could, um, could look at. And you can see really some very dramatic differences by region. So on the, the far right there, this is an example uh, awareness of zebra mussels. Uh, on the far right is the statewide number that I just showed you in the previous slide. But then as you move to the left, you can see that on the far left, New York City and Long Island, most people, over 70%, um, have never heard of zebra mussels. But then as you, you move sort of upstate and west, the Adirondack, St. Lawrence, Eastern Lake Ontario, Finger Lakes, Western New York, it's the exact opposite. Most people um, are uh, aware of zebra mussels, and over 50% in, in some of those regions know something about zebra mussels. Switch for a few minutes now just to talk about these stakeholder groups. From the um, screening interview, we found that over 50% of New Yorkers uh, participated in gardening in the past year. About a third went hiking, uh, fewer went uh, fishing, camping, boating, uh, fewer were aquarium owners, and then at the bottom, uh, very few were engaged in water gardening or were farmers or nursery stock growers. Uh, these percentages are basically uh, what you would find in a standard survey of New York. They, they match up quite closely with participation rates throughout the the state. Um, amongst these groups, we were curious to see um, what, how many of them knew something about uh, invasive species. So if you recall from an earlier slide, about a third of New Yorkers said that they knew at least something about invasive species. And all of these uh, stakeholder groups are, have a higher percentage than, than the overall average. Um, gardeners and aquarium owners, not much more than than the average, but people like farmers or nursery stock growers, um, well above the average 60% knowing something about invasive species. So those are some of the results from the, the screening interview. Um, and like I said, at the end of this presentation, we'll show a link where you can get a copy of the entire detailed report, region by region, all sorts of good stuff. But now I'll turn it back over to Bruce to talk about the, the follow-up mail survey results. Okay, so then the next data set is, um, keep in mind, it's describing the 75% of the people who said that they, uh, who at least recognized what invasive species were. And the response rate for this survey was 47%. 47% of the people we tried to get to respond to it actually did. It was a little more than 1,000 people, so a, a decent sample size. And I will say a little bit about knowledge of invasive species as reflected by um, these results, concern about invasive species, and then we'll talk about some of the results for particular stakeholder groups and the behaviors that um, people described. So this chart 
shows of the people who responded to the web mail survey um, how many, what percent said that they knew something about invasive species in each of the regions. Um, to me, these numbers look fairly high. Um, at least 65% of them in New York City, Long Island, and up to 75% um, um, or a little bit more in the Capital District in the Adirondack St. Lawrence say that they know something about invasive species. This slide presents concern about invasive species, the percentage of the people who said that they were moderately or very concerned about invasive species. And again, to me, these percentages seem high. Um, they're lowest in New York City, Long Island, but still about two-thirds of the people there say that they're moderately or very concerned. And most of the regions are about 80 percent, um, with more than 85 percent in the Adirondack St. Lawrence region saying that they're moderately or very concerned. Okay, so now results for some specific stakeholder groups, and I'll talk first about boaters. And we asked about several different boater behaviors that uh, people might or might not engage in, and some of these were common and some of these were less so. So, for example, 83% um, of boaters said that they always drain water holding compartments um, when they're moving their boat from one body of water to another, and 7% said that they never do that. Also common, 79% said that they always clean vegetation off their boat um, that's caught on it, and only 3% said that they never do. Drying boats was somewhat less common, however. 62% um, said that they do always dry their boats before using them in another water body, um, but 17% said that they never do this. And then washing boats was the least common behavior. Uh, only about a third of the boaters said that they always wash off their boat with a hose when they get home, and 18% said that they never do that. So now I'll talk about campers. Um, so these are people who said that they went camping um, at least once in the last year. Um, how many people bring firewood from home with them when they go camping? Um, nearly 70% of the people never do this, um, but the other 30% do it at least some of the time. So around a third of the people do this at least some of the time. The percentages that take home um, leftover firewood from their campsite, um, again, a big chunk of people, 80%, never do that. Um, but the other 20% do it at least some of the time. And then what percentage of people clean their camping equipment before going home or to a different area? Um, there's a real mix here. Um, about 20% of the people never did that, about 30% always did it, and the rest did it some or most of the time. Okay, I'll talk about hikers. These, again, are people who have gone hiking in the past year. 92% of people who've gone hiking in the last year never take plants they find home with them, when they are hiking home with them to plant. Okay. Um, but there are 8% who do that at least some of the time. On the other thing, on invasive species. And if we look at um, those who clean off their clothes and hiking gear um, before going home or to a different area, there's a real mix. Uh, a little more than 40% never do that. Um, a little less than 15% always do that. And the rest do it some for most of the time. And then finally, for what I'll talk about today, are the gardeners. Uh, these bars show the percentage of the people. Um, we asked, in this case, we didn't ask how often did you do this because it was um, um, a less meaningful question, but we asked them whether they ever did this. So a little bit more than 55% of the people have removed invasive garden plants um, from uh, around their home. Um, about 30% have replaced invasive plants with native or non-invasive plants, and about a third have found out whether a plant was invasive before planting it. So as a reminder of our timeline, um, the telephone sur screening survey that Nancy talked about is now complete. Um, this lists the link through which you can find this report with the full results of this on our website, and I'm also happy to email that to anybody who'd like that. 
Um, again, the follow-up web mail survey that I just presented those initial results from, we'll be releasing a report on those next month, and then the stakeholder interviews we'll be reporting on in June. So that's it for us, and we're happy to take any questions.